Hit him with that theme video and that beat I wrote. Hey. Stand up, bust a rap on you. Mm. Tell somebody near you, I'm glad you made it to church today. Horns! Make sure they get their check this week. All right. Hey, we have an app for this series. If you don't know about it, there's an app you can go to and follow along each week. It's today, if you pull up the app, for example, it talks about the, the, what we're going to talk about today, which is comfort. And it'll already give you the notes for the day. If you follow along all through the week, What's up, Pastor Blossom? You can get the, you can study a Bible study every day. Thank God for Pastor Joy Agunterman and Patrick Huber building that app so that we can stay together. I've heard there's been over 26,000 people engaged in that app. Really, really cool. So use that, utilize that. All right, uh, let me go ahead now and read the passage I'm gonna focus on today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your own Bible, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 3 to 7 for our focus today. Here's what it says from the ERV, the easy-to-read version. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father who is full of mercy, the God of all comfort. Thank you, Lord. He comforts us every time we have trouble. So that when others have trouble... We can comfort them with the same comfort God gives us. We share in the many sufferings of Christ. In the same way, much comfort comes to us through Christ. Verse 6, if we have troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. Paul says to the church of Corinth, if we are comforted, it is so that we can comfort you. And this helps you patiently accept the same sufferings we have. Verse 7, our hope for you is strong. We know that you share in our sufferings, so we know that you also share in our comfort. Amen. You may be seated. Comfort. That's so good. Before I dig into this, you know, I don't know if anything, with all the pain in our world and all the tragedy and grief and suffering and sorrow, not just in our world, but that we've experienced in our lives, what a treasure it is to have access to God's comfort. Before I dig into this passage and we discuss comfort, let's go back to that survey. I'm just curious to know how it turned out. Where are we? So, so, so some of you are still voting, but this is where it is right now because we got some delays. But most of you feel most grateful for all of them. And here's, here's one of the blessings of it. You don't have to limit yourself to just one benefit. Like all of them are ours. You can take that down. But here's one thing you need to know, that every benefit comes with an attack from the enemy. There's no benefit that God has made possible to us as believers that won't be attacked by the enemy. For example, the way the, way the enemy attacks the, the gift or the benefit of forgiveness is by guilt, making us feel guilt and shame and condemnation. Whenever you feel condemned, that's not God. You know why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's the devil trying to make you feel ashamed and feel bad and hang your head down so that you won't feel you have the right to live for God or serve him. How many have ever been through that? Like, I don't need, I just need to sit down and shut up. That's the devil. 
We fall down, we get back up again. A just man falls seven times and rises again. With, with the Christians, our life is not fall free. We just keep getting back up and getting up and walking from where we left off. That's the blessing of being a, 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 a part of the family of God. The benefit of healing that God has provided for us, the way the enemy attacks that is with sickness and symptoms. Sickness and symptoms is, is sort of like the way the devil gets us to sin is through temptation. The way he distracts our gift of healing is through sickness. Sickness is an offer. Symptoms are an offer to enter into sickness. Now, I'm not blaming the devil for all sickness, but I'm not exonerating them either. Some sickness, though, is bad behavior, poor habits. But wouldn't it make sense for the devil to want us to be sick? Because even though being sick is not a sin, it is debilitating. It is depressing. It, it does make you, it disables you. And it is contrary to God's best for our life. He says, I will heal you of all of your diseases. What I'm trying to say is that every benefit will experience an attack. The benefit of wisdom is attacked by self-pride. The benefit of provision is attacked by this, I'm going to provide for myself. You're working in your own strength. Every benefit, the benefit of peace is attacked by worry. This benefit of comfort is attacked, and I'll tell you how it's attacked. It's attacked, the way the enemy attacks us is by creating counterfeit comfort and unhealthy ways of being comforted when we're in pain. So let's walk through this passage and see what we can learn. In verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, uh, there we go. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father who is full of mercy. Everybody say mercy. mercy. Mercy by definition means to restrain something, to hold something back. It is, it is oftentimes when the Bible is describing mercy or when people define mercy, they compare it to grace. So grace is when God grants us something we don't deserve. He extends something to us we don't deserve, like his favor, his goodness, his kindness. Mercy, on the other hand, is when God holds back something we do deserve that could be bad. That's why if you ever feel pain in your life, it's not punishment. Because God is full of mercy. He is full of mercy. The, the Clark sisters have a song that says, it could have been me. And it should have been me. And it would have been me if it wasn't for the blood. That's mercy. And the Bible says God is full of that. So what happens, so when you experience pain, what we're going to lead and learn in this passage, what you experience, when you experience pain in your life, it's not punishment, it is purposeful. That God is going to use that pain for his purpose and his plan in your life. It's not for punishment. So he is the God who is, first of all, full of mercy, and he is the God of all comfort. That means God will never run out of comfort. That every, there's, not, there's no trouble you can have in your life that God doesn't have comfort for. Yolanda Adams' song says, there's no pain Jesus can't feel, and there's no hurt he cannot heal. And all things work according to the master's perfect will. No matter what you're going through, remember God is only using you because the battle's not yours, it's the Lord. Well, watch this. The Lord is only using you. He's only using you. No matter what pain you feel, the Lord is using you. Well, how does that make sense, Pastor, that the Lord is using me through his pain? This is how it works. When you suffer pain and difficulty and trouble in your life, the comfort that God brings you, sometimes that comfort comes through wisdom, it may come through perspective, it may come through healing, it may come through provision, it may come through counseling, it may come out of his word, it may come just into your spirit. That comfort that you get from God through your trouble is now equips you to share the same comfort with somebody else who's going to go through the same thing you is. That's purposeful. Are uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So he says, I'm the God of all comfort. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Now, if he's the God of all comfort, you have to understand if God has comfort for us, then the devil will always have a counterfeit to it. And one of the ways the devil counterfeits God's comfort, that's how people get addicted to gambling and sex and drugs and alcohol and shopping or food, it's all an attempt to find comfort in pain. 
That's why we got to pay attention to the thoughts we get when we're in trouble. Let me, let me, let me go to, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and break it down for you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to show you an example of how the devil tempts us in the counterfeit comfort. For though we walk in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now watch this in verse 5, casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now stay with me for a moment. When you are in pain, you get thoughts. Those thoughts must be evaluated to see whether they are faith or fantasy. Whether they are of God or their imagination. Because if they're imaginations, they must be cast down. They must be brought under obedience of Christ. They must be brought in alignment with God's truth. Because what happens is, you have to understand that in order to get true comfort from God, it comes from faith, not fantasy. That's why the Bible says, cast down imaginations. Because the devil knows, and God knows, but the devil knows that if he can get us having thoughts that are imaginative and our mind runs wild, we might follow those thoughts with our behavior, and then we're operating in behavior that's taking us out of the will of God. So now in an attempt to find comfort, we actually cause ourselves more pain for ourselves and for others because we tried to comfort ourselves the wrong way. Sometimes you got to wait on comfort. Sometimes you got to hurt a long time, but you got to let God comfort you his way. And there's a difference between faith and fantasy. And it's a little tricky because if you're like me, I grew up, let me, Okay, I'm going to say it like this. I'm a little hesitant to say this because it's personal to me. Can y'all keep a secret about me? You shaking your head. You're going to tell this soon the service over. I ain't even... When I, was, when I was younger, when I was in elementary or junior high school in particular, I used to get in trouble a lot. It wasn't criminal. I was just rambunctious, disobedient, belligerent, and obnoxious. How about all them? That would be on my report card, obnoxious, <laughs> belligerent, insubordinate. I was really a class clown, but the teachers didn't think the jokes were funny because I'd make fun of the teachers and everything. Just, I had the spirit. I had the spiritual gift of Jonah. You don't, 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 don't mess with me. I got, I'm gifted in that area. So because I would get in trouble so much, my mom, the way she would handle it, she would just punish me. She made me stay in my room. So I spent a lot of time in my room as a kid. And my mother wouldn't even give me a time frame. Like if you're doing time, you can handle it better if you know how much time you're gonna be doing. But she just said, go in your room. And it'd be no like time frame, like go in your room. Like, so what I did was in my room, I created an imaginary world. I did that when I was a child. That's how I managed my pain through my imagination. So I created a world that I could survive in because the real world hurt too bad. I'm, I'm trying not to go too deep. I might share too much stuff. But, but, but one of the things I would do, I didn't just have toys to play with and action figure toys. I would, I, it got so deep with me, I, I may believe that pencils and pens were real people. And people that know me know that about me. Like I, That's how deep my fantasy world was. But that's how I create, that's how I manage my pain. Now that imagination serves me well because it helps me to be creative. But what you have to be careful about is what you develop in childhood, you master in adulthood. So because I am deeply imaginative, when God says, cast down imaginations, that's hard for me because that's been my go-to move when I'm hurting. Because I didn't just use it when I was a child. When I got older, if I ever got in pain, you couldn't keep me there. I would just imagine I was somewhere else. Okay. Who understands what I'm talking about? I'm try. I'm, okay, let me do it like this. Anybody that imagines with me, we don't, we don't smoke weed. We smoke dreams. We don't drink alcohol. We drink wishes. We get high on our imagination. So for example, and it, and, it, and, it, and it can go into your adulthood. So if that's your coping mechanism, let's say you're having problems in your marriage. Faith says, God, would you please help me to save this marriage? Since what you have joined together, let no one put us under. That's what faith says. Fantasy says, God, I would be better off if I was with somebody else. 
I'm going to talk to somebody. Let me talk to somebody in Fort Washington that's going to be honest with me. See, what you have to understand is the difference between fantasy and faith is very, very tricky because fantasy is a mental escape away from reality into a place of comfort and maybe even success. Faith is similar because faith speaks those things that are not as though they were. But the difference is, faith will always take you down God's path and keep you in line with his word. Fantasy makes you the driver, and you say, I don't want my spouse, I want her spouse. And I feel better when I think I'm with him. Oh, I can't get, no, it's real quiet in here. And I can't get, I, I feel better when I'm thinking about her. And it's all a coping mechanism for pain. Who understands what I'm talking about? Put your hand up, I'm going to call you out. So when God says, cast down the imagination and bring it under the authority of Jesus, that means I don't get to enjoy even inappropriate thoughts because you can learn to be comfortable with somebody even if you're just comfortable with them in your mind. Now, what that does is it allows you to escape reality, but it doesn't allow you to deal with reality and grow through reality. But faith says, God, give me the wisdom to fix this marriage, while fantasy says, show me how I can get out of here, even if it's just in my mind. Am I in your house yet? <laughs> That's why it's so important to know God's word so much that you can tell a counterfeit from the truth. When I used to work here, when this was a Kmart, I was a cashier here, there was a time when I was working here that it was a real prevalent problem with counterfeit money. And this is before they had the thing you can mark it with, the highlighter to see it. So when we went through training and they were saying, you know, there's counter people are using counterfeit money, I said, I asked the manager who was training us, can you show us some counterfeit money? He says, no, we don't train that way. I said, why? He says, we want you to get so used to seeing real money, real money, real money, real money, that when a counterfeit shows up, you'll detect it. You got to be so used to hearing God's truth, God's truth, you hear it, you see it, you listen to it, you read it, that when a counterfeit shows up, you say, that ain't God. I rebuke that. that ain't a lot. That's fantasy. See, you got to have, you got to have a spiritual maturity to pay attention to your own thinking and rebuke your thoughts when they're taking you somewhere you ain't supposed to go. Because watch this, your thinking will lead your body into something that's going to make things worse. Am I making sense to y'all? Now let's go back to this passage. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. Because there's a purpose for our pain. He comforts us. Watch this. He says, he comforts us every time we have trouble. Let me tell you something. That is the promise of a follower of Jesus. Now, let me just, I need to make a distinction here between a follower of Jesus and somebody who just accepted Jesus as their Savior. See, there are people who are saved. You ask Jesus to save you because you didn't want to go to hell. I get it. That's how I got saved. I was like, where's the heaven line? I'm getting that one. I just say, I don't even like it. I don't even like it real hot in the summer. So I definitely ain't trying to go to hell. So where's that line? I got in the Jesus line. I ain't had no intention of committing any commitment. Just, I don't want to have consequences. That's not who I'm talking about. See, most benefits that come from God, most of the benefits are all benefits of his children. This one in particular requires a level of commitment because if you are only someone who asks Jesus to save you, but you don't walk with him, you're not devoted to him, you don't listen to him, you're not being discipled into relationship with him, then you will try to comfort yourself. And your only purpose for the relationship is what you can get out of it, not what he's trying to get out of you. So this benefit of comfort from God comes to people who are committed to him. And this is the promise. I will comfort you every time you have trouble. That's why some of you need to understand. If you're wondering how in the world did I make it through that, it's because God's always carrying you no matter what the trouble is. Guess what? The comfort came with the trouble. And he says there's a purpose for it. It's so that when others have trouble, you can comfort them with the same comfort Ooh, is it, how can it be the same comfort? The reason why it's the same comfort that you share with others that you got is because God is going to send people in your life who have the same trouble you had. Yeah. And now, this is how it works. See, you don't even have to, so when you have trouble, when you have pain, let God comfort you. Let him heal you. Go through the problem. It's a long timeline for some of us. It just depends on how great the trouble was how deep the trouble was. But once he comforts you, you don't even have to seek out the people that need your comfort. 
He will send them to you. He will send them to you. And you're already prepared. What, and sometimes that comfort comes to wisdom or, or perspective. He, he already gave you what you need to give them. You didn't have time to go to school for it. Your life took you through it. Your, whatever you survived in your life and got comforted by God from, that is what qualifies you to minister to other people. That is what equip you to minister to other people. No, you don't have a marriage counselor's license. No, you sh no, you're not a professional therapist. But what you do have is a history of having a terrible marriage that's down pretty good. Now, with that, you now can serve other people. Who would have thought that you and your spouse would be sitting at a table with another couple trying to help them get comfort, comfort as bad as your situation was? That's how God works. You never planned it, but that's how he works. You may not be a grief counselor. You may not have a practice, but you know what it's like to plan an unexpected funeral. You know what it's like to have to make arrangements that you weren't planning on making. You know what it's like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with God holding your hand. And the only way you made it through is because God made it through. And when he sends somebody else who's got to be in the same shoes that you were in, you're qualified and certified to help. That's how that works. With the same comfort. I'm just giving you what God gave me. Because it, it came from God through somebody for you. Who understands what I'm saying? That's how this works. It's not punishment, it's preparation. Ooh, that's worth writing down. Your, 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 your pain is not punishment, it is preparation for your assignment. You never picked it, you wouldn't have signed up for it, but you are now qualified to help. And it would be a greater tragedy for you to keep what you learned to yourself when other people are going through the same thing you went through. Don't you shut your mouth. You done bled too much and cried too much and hurt too much and learned too much and got through too much to not help somebody else walk across the same bridge you had to get across. And people who are victims never grow up to that point. You just remain a victim and you're mad at God and you're mad at everybody else. And I'm saying that's not, you're never going to heal that way. You got to say, God, comfort me. That's your comfort. Your comfort is anger. Your comfort is being mad. Your comfort is bounding your fist against God. God said, I can't comfort you that way because, first of all, I'm trying to give you wisdom, and you can't get wisdom because you're too proud. Because you think you're too good for anything bad to happen to you. The devil is lying to you. There is no problem that can't hit any of us at any time in any situation. <laughs> Let me keep going. I'm got to calm down. Go to verse 5. That's how I'm going to get through this. Let me go back to verse 4. Let me see if I missed something. No, I didn't. Go to stay at 5. <laughs> stay at 5. If we have troubles, it's for your comfort. 5. We share in the, that's good. Five, five. We share in the many sufferings of Christ. Somebody say sufferings of Christ. <laughs> we share in the many sufferings of Christ. In the same way, watch this, much comfort comes to us through Christ. Please see this in the verse. Christ had many sufferings. Many sufferings of Christ leads to much comfort through Christ. The former makes the latter possible. It is the many sufferings of Christ that gives him the capacity to give us much comfort through him. The one who suffered is the one who comforts. Elbow somebody next to you say, you got to hurt to help. Oh, I wish I could teach this like I feel. The many sufferings of Christ have empowered him to bring much comfort. Let me do it. Let me do it like this. See, when Jesus, if I were to ask any of y'all, where did Jesus shed his blood? On the cross. Everybody would say, he shed his blood on the cross, and that is true. He shed his blood on a place called Mount Calvary on a hill called Golgotha, Golgotha's hill, on the Mount of Calvary, at the place of the skull, he shed his blood. That was on a Friday, and I'm telling you, that was intentional. He intended to do that. But what most people don't remember is that that's not the only time he shed his blood. This is one of them times, I wish I was in the church where they knew the Bible. The night before he shed his blood on another mount, it was called the Mount of Olives, in the garden called Gethsemane. In the place of the garden, of the, it was called the Garden of Olives, where olives grew. That night he shed blood, Pastor, was unintentional. He didn't mean to shed blood then. The pressure made him bleed. 
It's called hematidrosis. He starts sweating till blood came out of his sick skin. But he's showing us something right here. He's showing us that what you do in private and obscurity will prepare you for what you got to do in public. The blood he sweat on Thursday led to the blood he shed on Friday. Oh, I wish I could teach this. But he had to suffer in order to serve. And sometimes you go through stuff you didn't plan on it. But it empowers you to do what the plan is all about. I wish I was... Zelo, are y'all following me? Because they lost... Okay, let's go to the Mount of Olives. Maybe this will help you. The Mount of Olives, Thursday night, Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the Mount of Olives because that's where olives are planted. They have to understand the power of an olive is not in its constitution. The power of an olive is what's in the olive. It is the oil. Somebody say oil. But you can't get the oil until the olive is crushed. Woo. The olive has to go through pain in order to get to his power. Give me the picture, y'all. Y'all should be with me. Yeah, that was the cue right there. In order for the olive oil to come out, the olive must be hurt. You got to be hurt if you're going to help. You can't get olive oil from an olive that has not been pressured, that has not been under anxiety, that has not been crushed. See, olive oil was powerful in the Bible. They used it for culinary reasons. They would cook with olive oil, but only after it was crushed. They would use olive oil for medicinal purposes. They would put it on skin diseases and it would heal skin, but only after it was crushed. They would use olive oil during that time because it didn't have electricity. And they would put olive oil in lamps and they would light the lamp and the light would illuminate the community because that olive oil would burn and create light, but only after it was crushed. I'm in the wrong church. Even to this day, we use olive oil for benefits in our lives. Olive oil can help people with sugar diabetes. It can regulate sugar levels. It can, it can, it can handle insulin influxes because of the way olive oil is constituted. It has antioxidants in it that can protect you from arthritis and other painful diseases, but it can only do that after it's crushed. Olive oil is used to anoint kings and to anoint presidents and to anoint priests and to anoint prophets and to put power on it, but only after it's crushed. And I came to preach to somebody right here today. God's going to use you, and he's going to touch people through you, but it's only going to happen after you are crushed. Somebody say, Lord, I'm open. <laughs> if you got to break me to use me, I'm open. Use my pain for your purpose. You got to suffer to serve. You got to suffer to serve. I'm almost done. You got to suffer to serve. So Jesus was able to do this because he suffered. Some of you, who am I? Who's this male for today? <laughs> who's this male for? Who, who am I preaching to that understands? Maybe, maybe you in, in, in Landover right now, and, and maybe you've been trying to make sense of this. I got a word for you. The reason why, the moment you stepped up spiritually, and the moment you said, I'm going to start serving God at a higher level, and the moment you said, I'm going to be a deacon, or I'm going to be a minister, or I'm going to be a small group leader, or I'm going to get serious about my walk for the Lord, all hell broke loose. When you was minding your business, who am I talking to in here? When you were just a consumer, all was pretty well. But as soon as you got serious about the Lord, your marriage starts having problems. Your children start cutting up. Your health starts flaring up. And I'm telling you, that ain't only the devil. Sometimes that's not, and that's not punishment, it's preparation. Because your preparation makes you more compassionate to people that you would look down on. Do you know, since I had my knee replaced, and this thing is, drawn, it's got new, I got new stuff going on now. It's only been five months, but this is like something new happening. I don't even know what it is. But you know who helped me the most? People who had knee replacements. You ain't never had knee replacements? Don't, I ain't, shut up. Because, man, I had my, my meniscus toe. I don't, nope, nope. Man, I had uh, my knee scope, nope. Somebody said I had it replaced. What, tell me about what you, what, tell me, speak to me. Because you're qualified. Where are my knee replacement people at? It's a fraternity. You don't ask for it. We, you don't want, I would never go through it again if I ain't got to. But the pain has equipped you to help somebody else who's got, do y'all understand what I'm talking about? I got to wrap this up. Give me verse six. 
Paul says to the people, he says, if we have troubles, it's for your comfort. Listen, your pain is never just about you. Sometimes your pain is about the people God calls you to help. You ain't going to get to sign up. You don't get to pick it. It's part of the plan. So what do you do? Let God comfort you. Here's what you can guarantee. Here's what I'll guarantee. I will guarantee you this if you're a follower of Jesus. Every trouble you have, he's going to comfort you. I promise you he's going to comfort you. Here's the, here's the thing. Beware of speeding up the comfort by going to get your own. You're only going to make it worse. And it all feels the same, right? It feels like, well, you know, I got an idea. No, we ain't dealing with your ideas. <laughs> we don't need your ideation. I'm trying to get oil out of you. And see, you don't like pressure. <laughs> we can't get oil out of you because as soon as you get in the hand of the Lord, you run. I almost started naming who you ran to, but I don't want to get nobody in no trouble. We run for comfort. It's all comfort. But can you stay when he's pressing oil out of you? Because your value is in what you've suffered and what you survived. That's what people need. People don't need a faith of just somebody who's everything's been lovely. That ain't real. I need to hear from somebody who's been through this. You understand what I'm saying? One thing you can guarantee, he will comfort you. And this is another thing he will do. Once he comforts you, he will use you by giving the others the same comfort you got because he's going to send them to you. You ain't got to look for it. How many people have seen that in your life? I've seen that. Oh, God, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together. So some things I go through, I'd be like, oh, what is, what, what's, and I know this is another level of training. You understand what I'm saying? See, I didn't get these sermons out of Bible college. I got these sermons out of life. You see what I'm saying? I didn't get this out of a book. I got it out of my journey. And, and watch this. See, it ain't just anointing. It ain't just talent. It ain't just gift. Some people just want to be gifted and creative. You got to suffer to expand your capacity to serve. That's how it works. So here's what you pray. Father, since I am suffering and I'm in trouble, please comfort me. And please help me to not seek counterfeit comfort and make things worse. And Lord, even though I never asked for this, would you please turn my misery into ministry and use me for your glory? That makes sense out of the comfort is not just for me, it's for those I'm going to give it to. Now I'm going to close with this. I got one more verse and I'm going to pray. I got to pray for some of y'all today, many of you. And I want to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. The New Living Translation says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Our merciful Father is the source of all comfort. What it means is, is that the God of comfort is the God of comfort to those who can call him their father. This benefit is yours if you can say he's my father. I don't mean that you're just his creation because he created everybody, but are you his child? In order, to be, in order for God to be your father, you got to be born into his family. Your biological parents are responsible. They're your parents because you were born into their family. And it's interesting, you don't have to ask to be born naturally. That's a natural birth. You didn't ask for that. You ever had somebody in a moment of frustration say, I ain't asked to be here. That's true. Your first birth came without your having any input in it. But not so with your second birth. To be born again, you got to ask. You say to the father, I don't want to miss this one. I want to be your child. I want to be in your family. I accept your son Jesus as my savior and I want to be in your family. And I'm saying, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you are, you can do that right now. And no matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, his love is available to you right now. So at all of our campus, I'm gonna ask you to stand right now to every campus, just stand up. And I just want to serve as a bridge between you and your relationship with God. 
I just want to invite you to him. His love, a relationship with him. And he, if you're online right now, you can just put your hand up and say, that's me. I want to start a relationship with God. I'm, I want to be sure today that I'm in his family. If you're at one of our campuses or you're here at Zion Greenville, you just come forward. Just come to the front and say, I want that. We just want to rejoice with you. Say, why do I come forward? There's something about coming forward that's powerful because I'm walking towards God and I'm walking away from everything and everybody. Thank you. Everything and everybody that may be holding me back, so I'm coming forward. Come on, y'all. Celebrate them. That's what I'm talking about. Group hug. Yeah. I'm coming forward. I'm walking ahead. I'm moving ahead. Y'all move down this way so I won't miss nobody. Amen. Come on. Come on. Amen. Forward. Forward. Make sure I hug y'all. Come on. Yes, indeed. Amen. Yeah, yeah. They wearing these jerseys now. Bless you, Dan. Amen. Amen. Come on. Say something. When I was 15 years old, I did this. I'm not bragging. I, I came into the front. I said, "Man, I want God to be my Savior." Something else happened in my life. I was 19 years old because I did something. I backslid after I got saved. I was just, I had, I had Crisco oil on my back. I slid all the way. I slid hard. But the reason why I rededicated my life publicly to the Lord is because I wanted social accountability. And when I was 19 years old, I rededicated my life to the Lord and I have never looked back. I've never turned back. I've never, I have stumbled, but I committed my life to the Lord to serve him. And almost 40 years later, I'm still standing in that commitment that I made publicly. Now, if somebody here, you already saved, but you say, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord to serve him, to be committed to him. There's a world waiting on you to make a difference, but it starts with your commitment to the Lord. I want to pray for you today. You come on up, wherever you are right now. If you're online, you're in the chat, I'm still thinking of you. God sees you. Make that commitment to him. Amen. Who else? Who is that? Who is that? Anybody saying, I'm ready to go to the next level of commitment. See, when you make a commitment to God in private, you can keep your commitment private and nobody can hold you accountable. But you got to go public with some stuff. Amen. Bless you. Appreciate you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. I'm almost done. When I made that commitment when I was 19 years old, 
Nobody in that church knew who was walking up to the front. They had no idea how significant that decision was. I don't take any of these decisions lightly. You don't know who's up at this altar. It's going to change the world for God. But it all starts with a decision. That same boy that was, that was playing with pencils and pens in this world, God had his hands on me. You understand what I'm saying? I said God had his hands on me. The same boy that used to get in school, I shouldn't say this, but y'all going to be mad if I didn't say it. I got quick testimony. I went to Prince George County Public Schools every year, but one year I went to DeMatha. I didn't even make the whole year. They put me out. I'm telling you the truth. They put me out. On October 25th, the same school system I barely graduated from, the same school system that I got suspended and detention all the time in, is putting me in their Hall of Fame on October 25th. How about that? That ain't nothing but God. <laughs> so don't take lightly your commitment to God. I should have made that commitment while I was still in school. I was, I was 19, it was too late. All right, I wanna pray with you. Lift your hands if you can. Father, I thank you for those around this altar at all of our campuses right now. I lift their lives up to you. Thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ. We commit our way to him now. I want you to repeat this prayer with me if you're up this altar. I want you to repeat these words with me. Dear God, say it loud. Dear God, I come to you right now and I thank you for this moment. I want to be your child and I thank you for giving me time to get to know you. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and I thank you by faith that I am born into your family. Help me to walk with you and to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, I pray for everybody that's rededicating their life to you, who's making a commitment to you to follow you with all their hearts. I pray for leaders around this altar. I pray that as they walk forward today, that they're walking away from some things and some people that they may miss and may hurt them, but it's gonna be better for them. Replace old friends with the right friends. Replace old places with new places. Replace old songs with new songs. And replace counterfeits with your true comfort. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody agree, said amen. Amen.